even the even the secular realm, everyone is using that, and that's true. And we're going to see more and more and more of that. But I hope it's a place that we will trust God to give us um, um, unique spiritual ways to be to bring clarification to people that become confused with the prophetic. Listen. Oh, Shakita said, she said, I've been sharing the promises, that list of promises, and I've been sharing it with people. I know some have been blessed by them, especially during the time when folks are expected are expecting prophetic words. Thank you. I hope you guys are sharing that. Uh, I really, really, really do. That, that 365 promises has been a blessing to me, and that was from our message from New Year's. So if you get a chance, go and do that. I have uploaded the teachings from New Year's and from Sunday. The problem is I haven't had time to um, put them on Facebook as of yet. But real quick, I want to just go to, um, well, let's see, where is, hold on, let me see where some stuff is real quick. Again, this is Bible study. This isn't a formal service this evening, but there is um, something I want to share with you before we move in, because I don't know if you remember, but if you have been with us any length of time, meant that um, I want you to know that this is not trying to one-up anybody. This is not about pointing out people and, and making people feel bad. Um, I want us to know that um, at the end of the day, I know I was taught a lot of things that were crazy in the church that I grew up in. I mean, people did everything from fallout to, I mean, they would throw stuff at you. They would spin. I mean, but you know, the entertaining things that people do <laughs> when they're given a prophetic word. I mean, I don't know if you've seen this um, holiday meme that's going around, but it has this comedian prophesying to the Grinch. And so that's pretty much the state of things right now as we begin to look at the circus and talk about the circus more. But that's not necessarily a particular church. It's really the state of where people are in their hearts concerning God. And <laughs> so that's where we are. There's no way we're going to be able to cover everything concerning this topic tonight. But there are things that we do need to um, address and things that we do need to take a look at. I'm just going to go ahead and, and pull up the scripture, even though we're not going to go there right now. But I, I want to just talk about a little bit about... Um, I want to go to an old covenant scripture because this, this scripture, a lot of them are still relevant, but this first one is from second Chronicles 33 and six. And it talks about how King Manasseh condemned, was condemned for many evil practices. And some of those practices included sorcery. And the scripture says this, and he burned his sons as an offering in the Valley of the son of Hinnon and used fortune telling and omens and sorcery and dealt with mediums and necromancers. He did much evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking the Lord to anger. So I'm sharing that because we already know, and all of you know, that there is a very dark side to prophecy. Well, I mean, we have the prophetic, which is beautiful, but then you have this whole side of nothing but divination. And in the new covenant, one thing I want to say is that our focus, our focus as sons is making sure that we're not in the midst of mixing both. And in this day and time, we have people who are, and this is, this is, they have full-blown websites where they incorporate Christian prophetic practices with their psychic ability. This is a true statement. <laughs> so I know some of you have seen that. If you have, just give me a, a note that you know what I'm talking about, that you have seen it. There are many ministries that have um, people in their congregations that are using 
um, you know, I mean, actually using tarot cards and actually using familiar spirits. So we have to make sure that we are not leaning into a lot of that. I've seen people pull out books from other philosophers and say, oh my goodness, that philosopher said X, Y, and Z, um, set such and such number of centuries before. Now these are prophetic people and these are Christians. I would not do that because my goal is pointing people back to God, not highlighting um, the things that confused people may have released in a moment of clarity that could have been true. So <laughs> I hope that makes sense. So I want us to begin to look at the things that we elevate because in the midst of the prophetic, what we elevate and what we see as and claim as truth is just as important as it is to those people that are given it. But for us, we have to make sure that, listen, everything we do is pointing back to one source. So I always like to talk about that because people love telling you you know, we know other people have truth. I'm not saying that people don't. And we know that that truth can be really, really good. And we know that there can be moments of clarity in which people have truth. But for us, we need to bring spiritual truths back to the source, back to the source. So when we talk about the prophetic, we're talking about the Lord. We're talking about the Lord. The scripture of Luke 8, I mean, Leviticus 19, 26 to 31. I'm giving a few scriptures. We don't, we're not going to have time to teach on these, but I want to give you a point of reference. You shall, um, we, nope, I'm not going to read that one because, yeah, we'll read that one. You shall not eat anything with the blood, nor practice divination or soothsaying. You shall not round off the side growth of your heads, nor harm the edges of your beard. You shall not make any cuts in your body for the dead or nor make any tattoo marks for yourselves. Now, this is why I'm bringing this up because in some religious, religious situations, people will say, we're not supposed to have tattoos. We're not supposed to do this. But this particular conversation on this particular law in Leviticus is specifically, context is everything, is specifically speaking about people practicing sorcery and divination. That's the difference. It was heavy in their time. So a lot of the things that we hear, like in the new covenant, let's just go back for a minute in the Bible time and really face what they were facing. If we face what they were facing, they were literally dealing with the real deal. We're talking incantations. We're talking all of the crazy stuff. Um, this is Leviticus 19, and the book of Leviticus is full of laws. It's all through Leviticus and Numbers, different references, but I want to pop down to, um, uh, there's one scripture. I printed these out so I wouldn't have to drag you all through the scripture. Um, it's believing in things like, here's Numbers is a good one, for there is no omen against Jacob. There is no divination against Israel. At the proper time, it shall be said to Jacob and to Israel what God has done. I just like to point out words like omens, like people believing these weird spiritual things about darkness and death and destruction that, that you know, you have to use salt for this and you have to use incense to cleanse that. Those are the kinds of things that we're dealing with when we talk about sorcery and divination. Here's another passage, Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 4. Um, it says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things in those nations. Big. There should not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through fire one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens and sorcerers or, or cast spells or medium or spiritists. All of this is in the scripture, Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 14. Now, my challenge to you is to get you a real good interlinear Bible so that you can look at these scriptures in their original language. 
just see these different, look at the Greek word, the Hebrew words, and begin to look at um, what the interlinear Bible is good because you have the way the translators are breaking it down before they made it into readable English. So I always encourage that. That's a deeper level of Bible study. Maybe we'll do a, a, a little 15 or 20 minutes one day on how that works. But the other thing is you get the cross reference with the original words. And because we're dealing with um, more of nouns here, you can get a pretty good idea in the context of what they're talking about and the time in which they live. But here's one for Saul, and I'm going to end here. We all know this one. This is 1 Samuel 28 and 7. It says, then Saul said to his servants, seek for me a woman who is a medium that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, behold, there is a woman who is a medium. And then they gave the location of where she was. Um, yeah. And this is the consulting with evil spirits, demonic forces and demonic powers. And it's consulting with the familiar realm, familiarity. And the Lord speaks vehemently against these things in his word. Why is this important today? Because when we begin to listen to prophecy and we begin to hear people prophesy, many people are prophesying out of their, their own selves. They're prophesying out of familiarity and they're Listen, somebody wrote this earlier. I'm going to go back to it. It was before I really started teaching. I'm going to pop right back up real quick. I hope I can see it. It's um, a really good statement. And it, let's see, um, I thought it was there. I hope, let's see, I have, I have been reading nope, that something else. I'm just going down. Much clarification and okay, so um, we're going to go back to that probably later. There was a comment. If I find it, I'm going to come back to it. But I thought I saw a comment in here earlier. But here, we're going to go real quick to um, this one major point. Hold on one second. We're going to switch. We're going to switch. I'm trying to do this as quickly as possible. I just wanted to make sure we understand what that divination, what divination looks like, because when God is speaking and when he is leading us, we're being led by his spirit. And there's some clarity that needs to be said in the midst of that, because we have people when God speaks, it's going to be clear. It doesn't. I'm, these are my notes in my little notebook. It's going to be clear. It doesn't cause you to have to do tricks and all these of the steps. You're not going to see that. And we're talking. Well, and I'll explain what I mean about that in a minute. Because some people say God will tell you to go fast. I'm not talking about those things. He'll tell you to go pray. He'll tell you um, to, those are okay. But if you have to, um, Go buy things out of the store. If you have to put names in bottles, we're, we don't do things like that. God doesn't showboat. And this is the part that I want to show you. Because a lot of things that we're seeing in the prophetic right now, and that's the comment that I thought I saw, and maybe I did, but could not um, find it in the list. But a lot of what we see in the prophetic is the exalting of self. Most of it is about people wanting to be great and wanting to be super in the midst of their calling. Now, that's what I see. I'm not telling you to believe that, but I will tell you that 60% of what I see in, around me and the people that I interact with, you know, not in the conservatory, I'm not talking about that, but people are purporting themselves as something and they're operating in such strong familiarity and crossing over into things that look good because they believe that it will cause them to have some type of position or stature with people. If you can follow what I am sharing, 
then that is going to um, make sense to you because we do things because it draws crowds. So what do I mean by that? There is a surge of people that only want to prophesy to you dates and times. They only want to prophesy to you what is coming. But see, this is the thing, and this is where prediction comes in, because when prediction comes in, prediction can tell you what's coming, but it does not provide you with answers for the church. It doesn't provide you with solutions for the body. It does not lead you into the realm of we need to know this because God is sharing this to do this. So when you start seeing excessive prophecy, that's all about, you know, people can tell you your address, who lives with you. They, they're giving you all of these facts and it gets you because listen, in your mind, it's all true. They've given you facts, but the familiar strongholds can give you what can be seen, what can be visualized, but it can't give you the direction that God wants to carry people into. So I want you to really consider that for a minute because right now we have a whole lot of prophets. Just check out social media that will sit all day and prophesy to you about what's in your house. They will tell you all about your life. And that's pretty much all they will do. Have you guys seen that? Have you experienced that? Oh, well, I hope that you are hearing. I know it's um, quite, quite quiet. Um, there are people who I've met people and they'll say things like, I was sitting in the store and God just started telling me all these people business. And that's all they'll say. That's all they'll say. And my response to that is, why is he doing that? Why is the Lord telling you the most embarrassing moments in that person's life if it's true? Where are you sensing all of this from? And is that the way of the prophetic of the Bible or are we type, tapping into some kind of psychic phenomenon? Listen, listen, listen. I, I just, I wanna make it plain. I'm gonna take it to the word, don't worry. We're going there. I don't like teaching anything without the Bible being at the center. But there has to be some agreement. There has to be some agreement on what the Lord is intending to do if we're going to have this. Sorcery was real sorcery back then, <laughs> you know, and it is now. We don't really see it at the level people see it in third world countries where you have witch doctor full blown outfitted where you have witches actually practicing and people going to these services for healing. It, there, there are a lot of shows, taboo. I, I mean, listen, shows and things. And if you travel, sometimes you may have seen these things. But in the United States, when it comes to the realm of prophecy and other, and other places, there's a whole lot of familiarity that is just human and people that are confused and, and lost and caught up in clicks. You also have this place of tapping into that strange phenomenon where we see these people leaking into the church. Oh, oh wow. So we have to agree on these points as believers. First, this is a big one. Holy Spirit is the only one who releases the heart and mind and the will of God to us. We have to be convinced of this. Point blank, period. We must be convinced of this. Holy Spirit is the only one. And what do I mean by this? You nor I can prophesy into anything and claim that it's the heart and mind and will of God without the spirit. 
We all know that we are but vessels, right? We're only vessels. So if that's the case, then it has nothing to do with my great ability or how great I am because it's the spirit using the vessel. John 16, 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own. Clue number one. <laughs> it's so simple. I'm not trying to be deep tonight. Clue number one. People will speak of themselves. They will speak of their own ability. God shows me this. God uses me this way. God, they love that phrase. They love saying, I don't know people who do it like I do or, or whatever. You know, you may hear a lot of that before the prophecy actually comes forth. <laughs> you know, um, he will speak only what he hears. Now, one of the things, and, and he will tell you what is yet to come. We foretell, we don't predict. You can call it prediction, but I'm using it in a different way. We speak forth things that God has already released in the heavenly realm that he is bringing forth, right? That's prophecy. That's one vein of prophecy. We're not guessing. <laughs> we're, not, we're not guessing. He will speak, because listen, how can I say that? Because it's not us, right? He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what yet is to come. He will do that individually. And he will also, the spirit will also do that corporately. But there's more. There's way more than this. I'm just moving you through so that we have some points of agreement. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. And the call of the prophetic is to reveal the heart and mind of God. That's the first thing we have to remember. Now, the reason why I wanted you to go back and listen to those other teachings is because there's a pattern that I showed you in there. I'm not going through that tonight, but I want you to see that in the beginning, God revealed himself to us. He said, let there be light. He revealed himself. Then he revealed Jesus, which Jesus was God in the flesh. We know that, but Jesus spent all his time revealing the father. Then. Jesus sends us Holy Spirit, and now we have Holy Spirit whose main function in us and in the earth is to reveal the Father or reveal Christ. Then you have us who become filled with the Spirit, and by God, our number one priority is to reveal Christ in us first, that we become all we're supposed to be in him that we are able to follow the things that God um, has called us to do and told us to do that, you know, and then we release that to others. We are here to reveal Christ to others. I'm not saying that the Lord doesn't tell us that um, we're going to have a car or a house or what he wants to do with our future. What I am telling you is that when you receive prophetic words like that, the intention of it when they're from God is to always increase the kingdom of God in you and around you. The Lord is not doing it to make you great. And that's it because there's a scripture that says that the Lord will um, um, raise you, he'll put you before great men. And one day we need to teach on that even more because what that means is that the Lord puts you before people that may have great access, that may be great in the eyes of other people, but it's not for you to say I'm before great men, it's before you so that you have access to those great men and through them to be able to continue the kingdom of God. So when I'm being prophesied to, you have to make absolute, even when somebody's giving me a wonderful, exhorting prophecy, I have to make sure that that prophetic word is not transferring some type of idolatry. Do you follow what I mean? Because we don't want to believe the hype that comes from flesh-based prophetic words. Now, God encourages us. 
But I'm going to give you an example. Remember that little chick that was following Paul talking about, I know you're a man of God. I know you're a man of God. And she was just badgering him and doing all that. That's what I'm talking about. If you know that little pet, little, 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 little scripture that seems like it's stuck in the middle of nowhere, Paul rebuked her because he recognized that line spirit and he knew that that was a hook word to try to pull him out of the spiritual realm and into himself. I'm just, that's what that was. If you go back and look at it and she was doing it openly um, around people and she was drawing all the attention away from God and putting it on a man. We see that little thing everywhere. Everywhere. We see that in lots of people. But folks don't always um, recognize when that needs to be shut down. One of the things that we have to practice is thank you very much. I appreciate it. And you move on and change the subject. Nothing is wrong with that, uh, with that, when people are doing it genuinely. But when you see stuff like that, even in your own ministry and the praise, 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 you got to shut it down. You must shut it down because it is an open door. It is an open door. So prophecy today is established in Christ. This is a difficult one to teach because we don't have time today to dig it out but I'm going to try my best to convey what I mean by this. Prophecy is established in Christ in the covenant that Christ made for us. So when I talk about new covenant, I'm talking about the promise that we have in Christ through his sacrifice and through his resurrection. So the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10 gives us a strong foundation in this, but I wanna read this to you. And this is, um, we're gonna read about John the Apostle and he's getting all of these downloads of spiritual things. So, you know, we got a lot of people who worship their dreams and um, who worship the things that they quote, feel like they see that nobody else sees. You know how we do, <laughs> and I'm sorry but you're not alone. Some of this stuff is just a normal day in the life of the kingdom. We should all have discernment, my God. We should all be able to dream and have visions. I was telling somebody one day, I love your dreams and visions. And I said, I, I, I don't tell people's callings if I can't develop them and build them into that because I, you know, I, I just can't, I don't want that responsibility. But one day I had somebody just kept talking. And this went on every time we got together, they just kept talking. And, uh, you know, and, and I asked, and I've done this with several people over the years, but this particular situation, person's not in this ministry, so don't think I'm talking about you. But I, I said, I said, your dreams are powerful. And I know you think you are a seer. And I know you believe that this is how God is leading you. But all of your dreams are about yourself. They're about your destiny. They're about your own direction. They're about the people you love. They're about the people around you. I said, that's not, that, that, is, that is a wonderful place to be. But all believers should operate at that level. That is a level that every believer should embrace. I hope that's making sense to some of you as you hear this. We should be glad that we can commune with God like that about our loved ones. The Lord lets me know when people in my family are about to pass away. The Lord lets me know when things are going on with my kids and when things are happening. You know, that, that's just a basic believer's realm in the realm that we're prophetic. It does not mean the office. It does not indicate a seer anointed. It does not mean that you're called a rabbi, shy in the spirit, and, and then just go out and prophesy. It doesn't. It just means that you're activated in the power of a believer in your life. It takes more than that to walk in the office. But if you dream all the time, God's giving me ideas about books. I, I see the characters in my plays and skits. I see myself, 
that's the Lord releasing his, his plans and purposes for you to you is not a special realm. It's just a place of living in the spirit. If you're in a place and you don't feel comfortable, you feel danger, and the Lord says, get out of there, get out of the presence. The Lord says, stop talking. Those are normal discernment things that every believer should be able to cultivate. And the fact that you have this operating in you all the time means that you are very sensitive to the spirit, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there is an office operating. It just means that you have tapped into what it really is like to live in the spirit. <laughs> I hope that's simple enough. Sometimes we have to introduce people to the prophetic from that place first. I think we miss that sometimes and that simply because people are having dreams every single day. Oh my God, you need to start inquiring what are those dreams about? Now, when you get to that level and you get to accurate understanding and prophecy and it's not about you and it extends beyond your family members and extends into, oh, then we might have another gifting emerging in that. We might, we might, <laughs> we might. But so, so listen, I want to show you this real quick in this scripture. Listen, so Revelations 19, 10, it says, and I fell at his feet to worship him. This is John in the presence of an angel. John just got all of this revelation about um, the revelation of Jesus. He, he's hearing about all the churches. He's moving to God's plans. This, this is an apocalyptic passage. So here we are. And so John is so overwhelmed because Maybe this is the first time he's ever received such an extensive, extensive insight in the realm of the spirit with such detail over the course of time that he was having these experiences. So he's before this angel. And then he said, I fell at my feet to worship him. Oh, my goodness. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of the brethren who have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is this angel saying? This angel is saying, I'm sent and called just like you. I only bring with you a testimony that has been given to me. I want you all to think about that for a moment. This is one of the most profound illustrations I've ever seen of how the prophetic works on the inside of us. The, and look, listen, these angels are delivering these scrolls with these crazy good words in it. They could get an audience. They could fill a stadium. They could get millions of people to listen if they wanted to. Well, they have because we've been listening for, for centuries to this work. But listen to this. It's so powerful. He said, but I am just like you. I look, I ain't got nothing. It's just the spirit. The testimony is in me. Oh my gosh. Remember the tablets of testimony? The testimony was in him. Oh gosh. So if you prophesying, there's a testimony in you. And it's the testimony of Jesus to the churches. It's the testimony of Jesus to our heart posture. Listen, real prophecy will set your heart in order. I'm going to say that again. It won't just tell you how to get rich. Uh-oh. It won't just direct you on how to set up your ministry. That's still prophecy. That's still, I want you to hear me. The deeper things of God will save your life. It'll save your soul. <laughs> oh my God, the testimony of Jesus 
will come out of you. We are the temple of Holy Spirit. Not the temple of addresses and people with blue hair and whose names start with T down the street. <laughs> I mean, my God. My God. See the thing going to say, somebody's going to be a millionaire and you prophesying and you got 5,000 friends. Of course somebody's going to be a millionaire. This is the conservatory teaching. I'm all about pointing back to Jesus. I'm like, well, I predict you got somebody with the letter T living in your house. Well, I don't have nobody with a letter T. Is there a nickname? <laughs> Listen, come on, people. We falling for this kind of stuff. We're falling for it. My dog got name start with a T? No. Okay. We're going to keep going. In other words, the angel is saying, I am not revealing these apocalyptic dreams and visions to you. I am not the one releasing these words. I am a messenger just like you. Jesus' testimony is the spirit of prophecy. Oh my God. Everything must reveal Christ. Everything, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. God said, you're going to be blessed to be a blessing. I can receive a prophecy like that. The Lord said that everything, that, that the enemy is under your feet. So anything prophesied to me that puts him there, yes, that's from God. So uh, we're, we're going further. We're going further. We're going further. Again, we can't do this justice tonight. We can't do this justice Prophecy must always carry the mind of Christ for the kingdom with it. Now, this is something I mentioned on Sunday. God speaks corporately. When you go back and you read the scripture, when it comes to the body, oh my God, God always. Now he spoke to us individually, but there is a corporate mind in God. So when I, by saying that, I want you to know that how is this going to benefit somebody besides me? How is this going to, it's, it, there's got to be this selfless dimension. There's, there has to be a selflessness resting in the midst of the prophetic word. Has to be. There is a mandate to prophesy for the purpose of exhorting the body. We all know that. You know, we know the scriptures that support that. Um, let me see if I even pulled it up. It's so common. We can't go through everything, like I told you before, but we can look at some stuff that I think might be significant. Um, mm, let's see. Hold on. Let's see. Follow the way. Okay, so maybe we can use this. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. And then it says, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. We're just talking about the gift of prophecy. We're not talking about the office right now. We're not um, digging into that. But um, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues. It doesn't mean greater as in better. It just means that you have the preceding word of life coming out of you. It means that the testimony is alive and well. It means that you are releasing the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, why am I saying it like this? The generation that we have now, we have to find new language to define the prophetic because of what is happening in the world, because everyone is commenting out everything. To be prophetic now, psychics are calling themselves prophetic. People operating in that dualism, that, that psychic on one side, Christianity on the next. There are websites all over. The dualization of that is causing us to have to find ways spiritually, not branding, but ways spiritually to redefine what the prophetic is. 
So we need to be able to say, if someone says, what is the prophetic? I need to be able to say, it's the testimony of Jesus Christ moving from me for people in this day. It's the testimony of Jesus Christ making his way known. Absolutely. Somebody just said, if it only works in America, but not in the nations. Absolutely. We have to begin to look at those things. Prophecy carries the mind of Christ for all people. All people. It carries the heart of the testimony of Christ. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. What is the testimony of Christ? What is it? It's multifaceted. But the testimony of, of Christ is his hope. His hope for a perfect church. Uh, which, which means the people who are one with God. It's the hope that people will listen and hear and be drawn to him. It's the hope that conviction will come. It's the hope that Holy Spirit who is the author of our prophetic release. He is, because Holy Spirit through Christ in us, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We have a, a, a weapon of mass destruction on the inside of us right now. That's it, that's that, the hope of reconciliation. That's why the prophetic word says we must prophesy, that when we prophesy, we do it for the, for the exhortation, encouragement, and comfort of the church. That's why the scriptures say when we prophesy, we prophesy in love because it's the hope of reconciliation that we do it for. And listen, the greatest two commandments on the earth is love God and love one another. That's the spirit of prophecy that should come forth in everything that we do that feeds the eternal kingdom. Oh my goodness. The, the Lord has been telling me that we need a different way of teaching the prophetic because there's so much confusion. Listen, there are a lot of excellent ministries. I mean, excellent ministries in teaching the prophetic. And many of them are shifting in their language, they're shifting in what they're teaching first because all most people want to do is learn to prophesy so they can play the part. We have to get the circus out of people. And a lot of us are having to go back and say, instead of having you prophesy and just exercise the gift, let's talk about the purpose for it. Because if you know the purpose of the gift, you are less likely to abuse it. Listen, I have people come to me all the time saying things like, I need a word. Can, is the Lord speaking to you about me? And if there is no urgency, I'm not going to release. And sometimes some of the things that we hear, we have to get to know people and build relationship before we can begin to share some of the things that God reveals. And that's not because anything is wrong with them. Is because how we've been taught surrounding the prophetic. We're expecting an answer. And God does do some of that. But we have to become a people that are really focused on intention. How is that word going to benefit my soul in the long run? Thank you, God, for prophesying money to me. Stress is going to be released off my life, but this is how I'm going to bless people with it. This is how I'm going to increase your kingdom. This is what's going to happen. And don't be afraid to ask the Lord for specifics. Say, Holy Spirit, I need specifics. I hear this word about money. Show me, Holy Spirit, how that money that's coming to this person's life is going to increase the kingdom. Let me see it so I can be a blessing to you. We can take the prophetic word further if we'd only ask, if we'd only go beyond what we hear. God is not just there to tell us stuff. He's wanting us to say, most of the time, I, I, I love prophesying from the seer realm. That's one of the most powerful places. And I was taught this by my mentor. This isn't my own revelation. I got this from her and it resonated so much in me that I began to, because I used to say, God, I'm not a seer. 
but all of us as believers should be able to operate in any gift that God releases upon us at that moment in time. At that moment in time. Oh my goodness. Mostly the Lord dealt with me. I was ordained as a prophet years ago, back in 2002. But I didn't, I, I felt like I was ordained too soon. That was one of the worst things that could have ever happen was to make me a prophet because I thought I was the it. And I, I had the word, but the word was hard. It was unloving and it was undeveloped and I didn't know how to take it further. And when you're ordained too soon and when you jump into ministry too soon, calling yourself an office, your grow up time is hard because you have to learn through the school of hard knocks. <laughs> you know, you, you have to be humbled. That's the biggest thing. But it says here, um, it says here for follow the way of love and, e and eagerly desire gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy. Oh my goodness, why prophecy? Because pro the one who prophesies, listen, speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. And people want to be comforted. Most of us connect with others because we don't want to be alone. We want to be encouraged. We want to be strengthened. We want to be built up. We want, you know, but I want to tell you that exhortation and comfort and all of that includes correction. You can't, you can't have all of that without the other. If the only thing you're getting are, are excellent words all the time, you might need to step away from that group. I'm just telling you. I got the beat down from my apostle about two months ago. Woo! But I'm telling you, I thank God for I received every single word and I'm still working on growing from it. It charged my, my, my time away and caused me to really seek God and see myself. You need that, that in your life. I don't just want people telling me how great I am. <laughs> oh my God. I don't, you know, I'm like, who are they talking about? I, I need to be introduced to that, Teresa. <laughs> you know, come on. I want us to agree. Um, I want us to agree that Prophecy is established in Christ's testimony. It's established there. Established there. It's established there. Prophesying is not meant to just be a speech. You getting up and giving your word and sitting down. And I was on a, um, I was speaking at a conference. Um, I don't know. I don't know when it was. It was, it was maybe November. I can't remember. And um, I was talking about um, the office of the prophet and the writing prophet particularly. And I remember telling the people there, and this is in my class, um, in my school, I began talking about how I'm saddened by how a lot of writing prophets think that they're writing prophets just because they write the prophecy or feel the unction to write the prophecy or they feel like God is giving them 15 books, so I'm a writing prophet. You know, it's, it's just insane. Because when you begin to, to really look at the office of the prophet, and the Greek word, I'm, let me go here first. The Greek word at its core meaning means to speak the word, as in the tradition of prophecy from mouth is to speak on behalf of God. We know that. So I'm, I'm not telling you this because I think you don't know it. I'm just sharing a point. You know, so, so we do have that, the, being a mouthpiece, we do have that dimension. Also, an aspect of, of the word means to interpret the will of God. So a lot of people who teach prophetically, and you see us do that on Sundays within the um, conservatory. You see people teaching and you see them go all off track, not off track, but you see us go into another realm while we're teaching and we bring in prophetic insight on the scripture. So what you're seeing is another form of prophecy. 
but you'll also see that in other giftings as well, any area of the art. You'll see it in music. So we know prophesying is not just speech. And we know that it is meant for an audience of some kind. We prophesy to ourselves, of course. But if you're in the office, there's the people for you. I always say that. Many people who are called to the office of a prophet, though, or they are within, the, within groups and communities because the gifts are, are there. Ephesians 411 gifts are for a community. And the people hate when I teach that, but it's the truth. Ephesians 411 tells you that they work together within that community. That doesn't mean you don't do stuff outside of the community, but because we only prophesy in part, we only have part counsel because God has created us independently because all of the gifts are for the purpose of maturing the body. We have to get to this place where we're looking at what we're prophesying because when you see people who are operating in that prediction realm, they're, they're in the psychic realm, they're moving into these places, a lot of them don't like accountability and a lot of the things they prophesy are just strange when it comes to the things of God. It's really treading thin ice when you start talking about this because people are convinced that they're called by God, but there is just, it's just strange because it doesn't really line up with scripture in the new covenant. They're still trying to live out old covenant patterns and that is not how God designed the prophetic in our time today. It's just, it's just not, it's just not. We got to look, there's a better way. There's a more excellent way for walking out the office. And that more excellent way is interdependency and community, not trying to force Judaism on people. <laughs> look, I don't, I, I'm not into Judaism. I am fully into Jesus. And I want it the way Jesus has set it up. But so we're familiar with Nabi, Roe, Jose, but there's a fourth dimension, a fourth dimension. And I have this book. I sent it to one of the prophets in my ministry. I, we, we, whenever I find it's an old, old book, like written in the 1800s. And I ran across it online. I was just searching one day. It's a book about prophets. And I was so excited about this book. I bought the book, read the thing cover to cover within the week. It was so profound. A lot of the revelation we, that we think is all new, this stuff been taught for years. I mean, hundreds of years, they had revelation. But this one book, I think it was 1860, 1860, something like that. It was such a um, profound book. And I began to learn that how they translated and broke down the office of the prophet. And there's a there's one title that um there's one title that we never hear people talk about that is for the office of the prophet. And I hope I wrote it down. Did I? Oh, yes, yeah, right here. It's called, it says, and there is another name for a prophet type that is translated Ish Elohim. And so it should be right alongside Nabi Roe Jose, and then this one. And the, it's uh, it, there's different spellings because unfortunately with Hebrew and the different translations, there are many different um, spellings for one particular word, but this particular gifting just blew me away. Oh my God, I got caught up. And so I went online and I started ordering some dictionaries. I got some stuff from, um, I just got a whole book of, of about five or six books just on this one topic from it. Cause you know, I, because I'm in school or have been in school, I still have access to some of my academic resources so I can look up things and then I can go find the books. <laughs> Once you read the academic papers, you can go find the books that have those real sources in them. So I found the book and this, this particular word means man of God. So they call some, some prophets of the old covenant were called man of God. And it was an elevation of Nabi Roe Jose. I was like, God, what is this? This is so profound. This type of prophet 
was called man of God because of the level of righteousness that they, that they generated, listen, and walked in the level of humility that shrouded them in their calling to a point where they gain respect of people, not just for their gifting, but how they lived. They were beloved. They became beloved because they were able to balance humility and righteousness with how they live. Jonah would probably never have attained that particular title, <laughs> but he was still a prophet of God. Oh my God. It, it's such a beauty how they, how they describe this in the old covenant. This wasn't a person wearing their robes for show. This was a person that was so esteemed and so beloved, not only for the accuracy of their gifting, but for their humility. And they were prophets, which to me is profound because it's the one thing we don't often see when it comes to releasing the prophetic gifting. And I know I'm all over the place and we got to stop. But when we're looking at um, these strange manifestations that people are in, if you go back and if you go and look at um, those three videos that I showed you, I beg you, please watch it. Please go watch them. Not because I'm teaching them, but it talks about how to um, discern false prophecy. We'll be able to understand that when God is speaking to us, we don't have to pull an audience. We don't have to force people to listen to us by doing tricks. We don't have to waste three hours of my life while you call out people's addresses. And I'm sitting down and looking at you and in awe, salivating like, man, I want those gifts. I, look, I, I thank God that he's going to bless me. But when the Lord speaks, he speaks words that are going to align your life, align your heart, align your ministry. That prophecy will be clear. You won't get nothing crap. People won't have to shake and fall out and feel a certain way to prophesy to you. You should be able to prophesy by faith on your feet if you choose to. You can choose to prophesy in the new covenant. You can, your faith can be such that I can believe God is going to prophesy to me right now to this group of people. He's going to fill my mouth with everything that they need in this moment to give them comfort and encouragement and alignment and, and healing in Jesus' name. Oh my God. It doesn't show both. Pride will never be the center. They will never have to announce you, I'm the prophet of this house. Nobody else can prophesy. I know some of you have been in situations and in ministry where nobody else could prophesy but the prophet. I already know that when a posture like that exists, you're probably going to end up with a whole bunch of flesh when the word comes forth. Grandiosity, arrogance. You don't have to do that when God is speaking. Why? because we prophesy in part. When you come together, everybody does what? Bring a song, bring a word of encouragement. Oh my goodness. It doesn't give you flesh. If all a person is prophesying to you for 30 minutes and it's just stuff, just, just consider that. I'm not saying God is not going to tell you. I've had words about buildings and they're accurate 100%. But listen, when I, when I hear them, the Lord is speaking to me how he's going to bless people beyond me. How he's going to encourage me and listen to the, this, bless me to be a blessing. Bless me to be a blessing. There will be direction there will be conviction there will be listen the prophets of the bible didn't just walk around prophesying <laughs> they had other responsibilities they had other things that they did 
in addition to that. Oh my God, they ministered to people. They had people they were assigned to. They had groups they were accountable to. It's just, it's just heartbreaking when we look at what is happening today. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, God does not give information without reason. <laughs> he doesn't show you things in people's lives so you can harass them and hate them. If you see something and you all of a sudden are repulsed by that person, why? You need to think to yourself. Now, I'm not talking about dangerous situations. Well, my God, the Lord told me to get out of here. But if you are a habitual person that always sees the worst in people, this is how you know, because it'll be a pattern. <laughs> so, you know, seeing something negative and getting out of the way is one thing. But if that's your number one MO, if all you do is go to churches and tear them up, go to churches and find out everything bad you can, and then you go on Facebook and trash the pastor because you had a dream and you felt like this church is, a, that's something else. Look, that's, I saw somebody recently do that it grieved me to the spirit because i knew the pastor i said and then i knew how long that person had been at the church i'm like they mad <laughs> I mean, obviously they mad about something because i know this pastor and i've known this pastor for years and then when i went on the pastor's page the pastor was like just remember what you've been taught this will pass I was like, see, that's how you answer. You don't get on Facebook and rant and rave. If God is prophesying, listen, Jesus is life. And what you'll learn from those three videos is that when Jesus prophesied, even when he prophesied judgment, even when he prophesied death and destruction, he made sure life presented itself. He made sure doors were open where there could be. He didn't fight people who didn't, who had already made up their mind to hate him or to kill him. He said, he said, Lord, on the cross, Jesus said, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. He prophesied that. That wasn't just some random statement because he was a, about to die. He said, forgive them. And then we hear later he gave up his spirit. He died for them. One of the exercises we don't have time to do, but I was going to ask you to do it tonight, was to um, look through the new covenant and find prophetic words that um, were released by the apostles, not just Jesus, but by the apostles. Even prophetic words that were um, about judgment. And I love giving this example. I can give you this one example right now. Um, and I've done it many times. You guys have heard me do this, but I want you to see this. I'm gonna go to the book of Revelation because I, um, real quick. And um, I just wanna read this to you and I want you to hear it by the spirit. In the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, things which must shortly, which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by an angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Did y'all see that? He bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus for all things he saw. Oh my God, he saw these things, but he made sure that what he saw, he saw them through the lens of the testimony, right? Are you guys following? Then he said, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Oh my goodness, this is it. John to the seven churches, which are in Asia. I'm only going to read this part. Maybe two parts. Grace to you and peace to him who is and was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before him, 
before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth. What an exhortation. So before he even gave this word, he's like, Jesus has finished all of it. You just need to know that. He said, I want you to know that I'm coming in the, in, and I'm coming on, by, on behalf of, of the one who is, who was, and is to come. I am, this isn't me. And you need to know that. I'm coming. <laughs> so he, then he says to him who loved us, he starts with love to him who loved us and watched us from our sins in his blood and made us kings and priests to his God and Father. This is how you give a prophetic word, right? So he says, to him be glory and dominion forever. So his heart was already there, postured in the testimony before he began to share. And he begins to give us a, a magnifying glass of how to give one of the worst words in the Bible to some people in love. Then he says, but behold, he's coming in the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. Oh my God. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. Preceding a tremendous prophetic word to every church that was in Asia at the time. That hard word came in love. It didn't come. God showed me y'all condition. And God said, y'all gonna burn in hell. It didn't come wishing death. It came wishing life, but with judgment before them. Listen, some people aren't prophesying. They straight up lying. They're playing games in the church. Oh my goodness. We're going to skip. I just, I just, let's see. I'm going to skip to, we're going to go to um okay we're gonna go to um the the pergamos <laughs> and to the angel of the church of pergamos right so this is the, this is the angel this is this is john's interpretation these things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword i know your works and i know where you dwell where satan's throne is and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. Listen, all of that exhortation, do you hear it? But look at that next sen sentence. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put stumbling blocks before the children of Israel, to eat things, sacrifice to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent. What is my point? God loved them. <laughs> All of that going on in the church. Sexual immorality, eating stuff from sacrifice idols, holding on to the doctrine of Balaam, teaching Balak. But God says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. But look, he said, and you hold fast to my name. And you did not deny my faith in the days. The mercy in that. The grace in that. What the kind of prophets we got today, all they want you to know is all the hell you've ever caused. They can't remember your good. They can't remember your effort. They want you to know you are horrible and God wants you gone. Oh, my God. See, my assignment to you is to go through and look at the apostles in the Bible. 
Every time they brought a rebuke, every time they released a prophetic word, they answered this way. Jesus answered this way. Jesus didn't come to slit people's throat and to leave them bleeding on the steps. Jesus came to give life. Oh my goodness. Repent. All he said was just repent. He didn't say go build a hut. He didn't say put people out of the church. He What? He sure did not. No. He said change. Come back. Get away from all of that where you got lost. I'm here. I got a lampstand for you. A candlestick for you. I have a candlestick and I'm watching you. I'm still there. I know your works and I know where you dwell and where Satan's throne is. I know where all that is in you. But I remember how you, and you hold fast. How can you have these two things operating? It happens all the time. I had to get off social media because that's what the church is doing right now. Nobody has room to repent. I understood why David said I'd rather fall into the hands of an angry God than into the hands of men. Oh my God. Boy, listen, I'm with you. I know your punishment is going to be just. But people, they don't care. Huh. Then he said, let him who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the churches. The spirit is saying, I love you and I need you to repent. That's what the spirit is saying. The spirit is saying, God sees it. So all this stuff that we think we see, prophesy it through the heart of Jesus. Know what God is concerned about. God don't care that you got a person with a T in your house unless the Lord is saying to you, that person in your house is sick. I'm standing in the midst of you right now. And that person's name is such and such. And this is why the Lord is bringing me forth. Now, don't, I know plenty of people who operate at that level of grace and mercy and beauty and the prophetic gifting. And it's all God. But the mother people, that ain't what that is. Are you all following what I'm trying to share? Because I don't want you to think I'm speaking into addresses and telephone numbers. Because if the Lord is going to give somebody your address and telephone number, he's going to give them a reason for why he's doing it. You're probably going to deliver some food. There's probably something going on that you're going to intervene. There's going to be something behind that that's going to reveal Christ's intention. And it's going to glorify God. Right? It's going to glorify him. It can, because it's not you, it's the spirit. And God can use people in all those different ways. I know people that God has called to arenas where there's a lot of um, what's happening in the church of, church of Pergamos. A lot of this stuff is going on. And God called them to those places to serve, to work, because God said, look, they hold fast to my name. They did not deny my faith, but they got all this stuff going on. But I want you to help them. I want you to help them. I want you to give them life. Don't get mad because the scripture is saying this. I'm not making this up. How did all kinds of people come to my ministry? And then you got all the people around you that's trying to kill you for it. But I understand, as they say now, the assignment. Think what you want, but I'm going to do what God said. You're not going to kill people just because you think I should be like you. <laughs> okay, Tiatra. These things says the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works. I know your love. I know your service. I know your patience. 
As for your works, the last are even more than the first. Nevertheless, you like Jezebel. <laughs> Poor Jezebel, man, she been shredded in the church when all she needs is deliverance <laughs> and salvation and God is able. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess mm -mm -mm, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent. Oh, what? And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Now that's a problem. She got to go now because she refused to repent. Now I will cast her in a six bed, those who committed to. So we have to read these things in context. Now, I will tell you, spiritually, um, spiritually speaking, don't take this and think that this is a license to go and kill people and trash them and do this. Everything has their place. Everything has their specific situation and circumstance. Not all things fit all things. But I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will go each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say and to the rest of Tiatra, as many do not have this doctrine who have not known the depths of Satan this day, I will put you, I will put on you no other burden. <laughs> so here he is again, encouraging, even in the midst of all that. But hold fast what you have till I come. And whoever overcomes, look at that. He said, I'm here standing with you so that you overcome. Huh. So that you overcome. Anyway, I hope that this is blessing you. And I don't know, I feel, I feel like a little bit I was all over the place and I had a slow start. But we, ha we have to have clear ears. And I know people teach discernment as some special gift. I, I don't see discernment that way. I see discernment as something we are all supposed to have in the kingdom and that we're all supposed to exercise and find strength in. Every believer needs discernment. I don't believe discernment is a special gift. I don't believe the prophetic is a special gift, but I do believe there are different graces. I believe everybody has a merit, of, a merit and a measure of grace in their calling. I can say that God has given me grace in teaching, that the ability to help people understand the ability to help people be immersed, the ability to elevate Christ over men. That's a grace that I have. I'm not the only one with it, but it is a grace that I have. I have a grace to prophesy in certain areas. When people are, especially when people are ridden with sexual abuse and sexual sin, there's a grace in my life over that area. certain situations and circumstances, you can see it. The same can be said for you. Oh my gosh. Sometimes we just have to hone in on our grace. Where is your area of specialty? Listen, there are people that I have met that have this grace of fathering and mothering. Just their presence breaks the strongholds on people's lives. Just the way they say their words and speak loosens up the mucus of, of rebellion and offense on the inside of people. And God just opens the door for them to be able to prophesy. You may have heard the same word. Nobody listened to your word, but when that person came, the grace on their lives gave them access. That's one of the reasons why we have to understand why interdependency is so important. 
Listen, there's some people I will never be able to reach because I remind them of somebody else. And it's not my fault. But in community, we have to compliment. Right? I'm just going to share this last passage with you all. And I, I met with one of my old mentors last week, and she was talking to me about enmeshment and interdependent, and not interdependent, but trans, the spirit of transference. It was one of the most powerful conversations. She taught me everything I know about those two things. And it blesses my life to have, to be able to quote back to her things. She cooked dinner for me and everything. And it was just an amazing time. And I was able to um, share, come to find out she's been following my ministry. I hadn't seen her really since I was commissioned. But I want to show you this, and then I'm going to close. And this is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite things to teach. Um, well, you know, it says here, verse 4, well, I, I'm going to start. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of your calling in which you were called. So we got to listen to the Holy Spirit first. With all lowliness and gentleness, there's that cry of humility that I mentioned to you, and with long suffering bearing with one another in love, even Jezebel, enduring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in the hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one immersion, one God and faith of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, the grace to do, the grace to accomplish, the grace to be, the grace to achieve what you've been assigned to was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. He said when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some to be apostles, emissaries, prophets, evangelists, proclaimers, pastors, shepherds, and scribes, teachers, the instructional scribe is what they're talking about there, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, and this is my favorite part, till we all come into the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why am I sharing this? Because even the prophetic words released to the church in Revelations was intended to bring them into maturity. It was to give them life where they were, even though they were mixing and trembling with death. He came to give them another opportunity, another chance to walk this out the right way. He wanted Jezebel and all her predictions out of the church. But at the same time, he knew that good intention was there. And he knew that even in that condition, they were worth saving. One of the things that I believe we have to teach prophets in this hour is how to love like Jesus. If we're not teaching, how can you teach the prophetic and you've never taught anybody how to love? How can you teach the prophetic when everybody wants to put on a show? They want to be acknowledged as prophet, as this, as that. How can you really teach when the mind, the motivation, the interests of people, when we teach on Ephesians 4.11 ministry, we, all, we start with the whole revelation of Ahava, the marriage covenant. God is married to us through Jesus. We teach the marriage covenant first because if we understand marriage, because that's what the church is, you know, people love to have marriage counseling, which cracks me up. They want you to work out all that ugly in your marriage, but they can't make the correlation of what that looks like in the church. You want me to forgive my husband for, for all of these things or forgive my wife for all of these things. You want us to stop bickering and fighting, but yet we want to prophesy and praise God because we can't understand that our marriages are mirrors of what the church should be. 
if we can conquer and we're not being beat up and strangled in our marriage, my God, if you can't get over a little disagreement, how in the world are you going to be responsible for anything in the body? I like that analogy because I found that it helps couples. But I want you to be encouraged tonight. There are some excellent prophetic ministries out there. So this isn't about that. This is about conservators knowing when you've been thrown a, 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 thrown a hook or a worm from some kind of fly fishing pole. You need to be aware of what you're getting. People flocking for a show, a, a full-blown three-ring circus. Ringleader, acrobat over here, magicians. <laughs> I mean, tightrope walkers, we got them all. But you need to know what the voice of the Lord sounds like. I know what it's like to want to prophesy. I want to exercise the gift, but we need to exercise our heart. We need to understand how to love. We need to reread the book of Revelation through that introduction. And then we need, as an assignment, look at the lives of the apostles, not just Jesus, because we always talking about Jesus, but we demonstrated what he was doing when we read Revelation what Christ was doing, because he wasn't Jesus there, he was Christ, the risen, the resurrected, the eternal. So I just hope that um, you've been blessed. Father, I thank you that there's no confusion from this teaching. I hope that the conservators are ready for us to jump in and really dig into the prophetic line by line. I thank you that this is a part of the seal teaching. But if you, it, it, but intention is everything. Father, I pray that what is, what is it that Jesus wants to accomplish in this? What is the outcome for the body? Why, if it's doom and gloom, why? I love it when a prophet or an apostle prophesies, this is what's going to happen over the next five years. We're going, this is what is to come. There's preparation ahead for you, but don't worry because God is yet keeping his word because that is the truth of it. He's keeping his word to the church. If we believe on Jesus Christ and we know it's already settled because God does not lose. So Father, we just extend ourselves to you. And we ask, Father, that we'll be anxious for nothing, not even our calling, not even our understanding. And Father, wherever a little divination or, or confusion or psychic ability, wherever there has been pride and arrogance, wherever we open the door to witchcraft, wherever those areas are, you alone are powerful enough in us because Holy Spirit, you are alive and well on the inside of those who have said yes to the Lord. And Father, we just thank you that we align with you tonight, with your spirit. Father, that we align with teachings that have no motive in people, but all motive in Jesus. That we learn what it is that you want. And that we use our gifting and our talent, Lord, not to be great before men and to be um, celebrated, but to be effectual builders of the kingdom that we can truly posture ourselves like Christ and say, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Where we can see corporately, we can see individual gifts and talents and positions and places. But at the end of the day, it's the team that brings the prize home. So we thank you for the conservatory and those Lord, that are willing to walk through uh, just a revised understanding of the prophetic, where our approach is just seeing through the eyes of Christ. Oh, what is being accomplished with this word? What is being accomplished with this prophetic act? Lord, being a prophet or, or is not just about prophesying. It's also about the other duties that nobody talk about that is associated with the office, God. It's about those things that put us there, not just the teaching that puts me in a center, not just the prophetic utterances, but the heart to see people made whole, the heart to see people pure, that the righteous man, the righteous man rises where we will be beloved, before a beloved Jesus. 
In Jesus' name, amen.